The problem is that's all I got to football. Um, I, I figured out to run around and hit a bunch of people. So I, I literally in college, they were like, we're going to have these intramurals. So I ran around and hit a bunch of people. I found out later that is not how you play football. It's just the fun part of football. They have something about the ball, and there's lines, and I don't know what those mean. And you don't just hit people. But I also tried another sport. It was basketball. Basketball was even more weird because you're really not supposed to hit anyone. I found this out after the fact, too. And so we were playing this basketball, and he takes the ball from me, and I hit him. And then it made sense to me, and I broke his nose. It was an accident because, I mean, I was trying to break his nose. I was just hitting him, so I could get the ball back. It made sense to me. He took it from me. I took it from him. And to this day, we are actually still friends, even though I broke his nose because he took the ball from me. And I love this verse in Proverbs. It's faithful are the wounds of a friend. And, and there's two types of wounds. There are those wounds where, honestly, I, I didn't know how to play basketball. And I broke my friend's nose. Then there's those wounds that are more intentional, but they're meant with a much more positive. They're not neutral, they're positive. It's when we actually we come clean and we say those things that need to be said. One of my favorites was I, I had a friend talk to me before I preached one day. I don't remember who of you it was, but you said there's a booger hanging out your nose. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm guessing a lot of y'all saw it as we do, and I'm getting ready, and obviously I don't realize there's a book. And one of you came up and told me. That's one of those, the wounds of a friend. It is. It, it's, it's so much better to hear from one person than later to look at the recording and go, y'all watch that all the time. Thank you. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. They got it. But tonight, I, I want you to, we're going to look at Israel. And Israel's the dad. Israel's giving a blessing to his children, 11 of them, and two. He's giving a blessing to Ephraim and Manasseh because that's Joseph's sons. I just covered Genesis 48 for you. And I want you to hear what he says and how honest he is with his children because he's got something we're not guaranteed. Is that last chance. He knows he's dying, he's on his deathbed, and so he takes that last chance to do this. Gives him wounds. And to be honest with his sons and not be like, well, everything about him is great. Because it's not true. So we begin in Genesis 49. Starting in verse 1. Then Jacob called his sons and said, gather yourselves together that I might tell you what shall happen to you in the days to come. Assemble and listen, O sons of Jacob. Listen to Israel, your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the first fruit of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. Unstable was water. You shall not have preeminence, because you went up to your father's bed. Then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Weapons of violence are their swords. Let my soul come not into their counsel. O oh, my glory, be not joined to their company. For in their anger they killed men, and in their willfulness they hamstrung oxen. Curse me their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. He starts out, and you can tell that this is not going to be your traditional lesson. I thought because it wasn't round, it wouldn't roll. <laughs> um, told you I didn't know what but he says something here, and I want you to get this. He says something, and it does come true. It's not that it doesn't come true. He says about Simeon and Levi that they would be divided. And instantly, we get the same idea because he says it. He says, because you have fierce wrath, because you have anger. But if you look at the dividing of these two tribes, they're completely different. Simeon's divided because he's scattered into Judah and just kind of mixed in. He becomes such a small tribe during the Exodus that... Uh, just kind of throw him in with Judah. That's generally what happens in the book of Exodus. But Levi doesn't happen that way. Levi gets scattered. But Levi, during the Exodus, the tribe of Levi is the only ones who don't go out and sacrifice to the gold calf. So they become the priests. 
And then the priests get scattered because you needed Levites. A city of refuge for every tribe. And, and so there is this sense where, yes, this is the coming down from Israel, and there's this prediction, and there's this prophecy, but there's still this ability for the individual to change it. Because in this, one of them is scattered, completely just generally lost as a tribe. And one of them becomes one of the most important tribes, the priests, the high priests. Those who protect, those who shadow justice, those who proclaim God's word, come from Levi. He continues in verse 8 with our favorite. Judah, your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion. And as a lioness. Who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples, binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He has washed his garments in wine, his vesture in the blood of grapes, his eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth whiter than milk. Judah, he's honest with Judah, and it, Judah was not a good character. He wasn't much better than Reuben. He, he, he did the same violence. He has this terrible violent streak, especially when he came to Joseph. But Judah's blessed because of not where he started. Judah's blessed because in the end, Judah's the one who's willing to sacrifice himself, give up his life for Benjamin, give up his life to save his people. And so God gives one more promise to us. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Where does Jesus come from? Judah. Verse 13 continues. Zebulun shall dwell at the shore of the sea. He shall become a haven for ships, and his brother shall be inside him. Issachar is a strong donkey. Crouching behind the sheepfold, he saw that a resting place was good and that the land was pleasant. So he bowed his shoulder to bear and became a servant at forced labor. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that his rider falls backward. I wait for your salvation, O Lord. Raiders shall raid Gad, but he shall raid at their heels. Asher's food shall be rich, and he shall yield royal delicacies. Naphtali's a doe let loose that bears beautiful fawns. And then his favorite son, Joseph, is a fruitful bow, a fruitful bow by a stream. His branches run over the wall. The archers bitterly attacked him, shot at him, and harassed him severely. Yet his bow remained unmoved. His arms were made agile by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. By the God of your father who will help you, by the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that crouches beneath. Blessing of the breast and of the womb. Blessings of your father and are beyond the blessings of my parents. Up to the bounties of the everlasting hills. May they be on the head of Joseph. And on the brow of him who is set apart from his brothers. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning devouring the prey. And at evening dividing the spoil. Verse 28. All these are the twelve tribes of Israel. This is what their father said to them as he blessed them. Blessing each with a blessing suitable to him. So, of his two favorite sons, we don't see much favoritism in this blessing. Because we know his two favorite sons are Joseph and Benjamin. Joseph obviously gets this glorious, oh, you'll be great, everything's going to be beautiful, amazing. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. Okay. These are his favorite sons. He, he's been honest throughout the whole book of Genesis. Israel has big favorites, they're Joseph and Benjamin. And yet when he comes to his deathbed, that's not what he's even thinking about. He comes to his deathbed and he's thinking, I'm going to be honest with my children. And he's honest with his children because he gets this opportunity to know that he's dying.
And a lot of us live just like that. We don't have any occurrence where, where Israel has really done the good discipline thing. We, we don't have this where Israel comes out and the children is like, this is terrible. But we also don't have something else we have today. Where Israel goes, well, oh, they're out of the house. They've grown up. I, I, I no longer have any responsibility over them. They have families. They've gone their own way. We're in a place that's not even mine. We don't live on my farm. We live on Pharaoh's beautiful land. And he takes this opportunity and he says, I'm going to die. I'm going to be honest. And in his beautiful words that are called a blessing, somehow. Because he blesses them with what's suitable. With what they deserve. With what they need to hear. And it's one of those where we don't do that very often. Because, like Israel, we, we would love to have that deathbed confession, you know, that deathbed time where we get to be honest with everyone. And we get to tell them exactly what we're thinking. And go, you know what? I should have told you. You're a terrible person. I mean, and I, I understand you, you heard the blessings of me, but I don't think you get the point that most of them were, you're a terrible person because. And that's what it was. It was, you're a terrible person because you did this. Really, you never stood out. You will be a slave because you just, well, you go and do whatever is the popular thing to do. That's probably one of my least favorite is when he says that you will bend your back to be a slave. And the only thing you can read about him, and the only reason it's ever put there is that just every time he's in a story, he's just doing whatever Judy's doing. Somebody says do something, he's just joining in. He's right there, following along. And when Israel gets the opportunity, he says, I'm going to confront all these issues. But we don't. We were raised in a society that teaches us that everyone is good. You being you is good. And it's a cute idea and it's a fun idea. And the problem is, that's not me. I should be glad about myself because of the good that I've done and the good that I can do because of who's in me. I shouldn't be glad because I'm me and I'm good. And the risk is that we tell people that they're great and we build them up and build them up and they never get to see the truth. They never get to go, hey, you know, if you took out that booger, it'd make a whole lot better sermon. It'd distract me, trust me. Somebody's up there with a the booger, I'm gone. <laughs> but in something so simple, we can see something quite a bit bigger is that we need to be honest because we aren't guaranteed that death day. We, we aren't guaranteed to be like him where we, we get to be honest and open and say, you know what? I know you've been told all these great things your whole life, but let me be a friend. Because the other part of that verse that I did not put up from Proverbs is this. The kisses of an enemy the, the wounds of a friend and the kisses of an enemy. And I want to tell you this. When it comes to my son, I don't want to be his enemy. On a scale of friend or enemy, I prefer friend. But the problem with that is, for Israel to be a friend to his children, he needs to call them out. For him to be a good dad right here, he needs to call them out. He needs to call out Reuben just as hard as he calls out Reuben. Simeon and Levi need a good tongue lash. And he does it. Because he gets this opportunity and he seizes it and he does something that helps his children. And too many of us like the idea of being liked. And yet, our God risks something. He says that discipline is not enjoyable. But yet, a few verses later, God says, I discipline those I love. 
And to take that and say, we need to be more honest. We, we need to be more open about what we say, and it's not about being mean. It's not about attacking. It's about being honest. Because this is not something we're used to. We have this term, they're, they're called white lies. They cover up everything. You can cover up a multitude of sins with a good white lie. And it is, if someone comes to you and it's rude to tell them the truth. If I come to you and ask you a question, why do I want you to lie to me? I just won't ask you the question. If I really came to you and asked you a question, I wouldn't want you to lie to me. Otherwise, I'm not going to ask you the question. I'm not special. You might be crazy, but not special. If I come to you and I say, you know, does this look good? I'm going to look like an idiot today. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I asked because I wanted to know. But yet when people live their lives and we, we have this opportunity to talk to them, well, live and let live. You know, don't ever tell anybody that there's something wrong. Don't ever tell anybody from the bottom of your heart how you really feel. Now, when you're on your deathbed, that's okay. You can say anything on your deathbed. And you're not allowed to speak ill of a person right before their death and right after their death. You can wait two weeks. It's, it's the rules. They're perfect for four weeks. I got it. And the problem is, if we wait for that, we don't actually know what we're going to get. The other day, I, I sat with somebody for a couple of hours at a hospice, and she was like, we were playing, we were talking, we were joking about cookies. And my son wanted cookies, and then he said he didn't want any cookies, then he ate half of the cookies. And we were just talking about nothing. And it was just, you know, fluff, fun stuff. And she said, and the next day she has a stroke, I can't talk. And she's trapped. And that was what she was talking about, she's trapped. We know that she could hear us, but she couldn't talk. She couldn't say anything. She couldn't move. She couldn't communicate in any way that would give us any sign. We couldn't get a two blink for no, one blink for yes. And we go through life and we're not guaranteed a death that's like Israel. Sometimes our death is something like that. But we're coming along, we're talking about cookies. Boom. We're unable to communicate. We don't have the opportunity to tell those around us out of love what they really need to hear. Because the truth is, that's not what we're taught to do. But Christianity, you have to realize, Christianity comes at a time that doesn't make sense. It's a time where no one's talking. There's no prophets at the time. John the Baptist shows up and everyone's like, whoa, something's happening now. It doesn't make sense in that we have a God who dies. We have a God who suffers at the hands of human beings. Now think about this. God, being the nature of God, cannot be touched by us. God, being the very nature of God, says He's all-powerful, says He is the original being, says that He has nothing to do with being attacked by the creation. We can rail at God, but we can't do anything to Him. And Christianity brought in this complex system that said everything you believe is wrong. And we always want to look at the Scripture and we're going to be like, well, I got it. Well, duh, because it gives you the answer in the beginning. Mark begins with this. Jesus, the Son of God. Wait, wait, you just gave me a heads up. You told me what's really going on. Everybody in the story is confused, though. And, and everything's different. And the whole point is it's going to be so countercultural. Counter to everything you believe. And we go, well, it was only countercultural back then. It's just as countercultural today. <clears throat> our culture today, our culture of live and let live and never be honest with somebody is the most hateful, maniacal, evil thing it could be. Because we're convinced that lying to people is how we help them. We make them feel good. We shouldn't feel good about everything. My son does something wrong. I don't try to make him feel good about it. I say, that's terrible. Why am I staring until he gets the point? I want him 
to understand bad. I don't want to feel good about it. I wanted to understand results. I don't want to hide things. I, I was criticized for the way I dealt with one of our dogs died. Ran out here in the road. Got his head scattered, shattered. Sad day. My son was told something. It was my, I told my son, never open the front door. Just don't do it. I don't like the front door. The other reason is there's no gate once you get out of the front door, so it makes sense why I was saying it. I was criticized because I was honest with my son. My son opened the front door. My dog Hannah ran out the front door, ran out to this road right here, boom, shut it in. And I was told, no, 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 shelter him. Shelter him from this. Shelter him from there that there's bad consequences to bad actions. And I, I, I just couldn't understand hating my son enough to do that. To say, you know what? Don't worry about it. I had nothing to do with you. Well, logic tells me that if the door's not open, the dog doesn't get out, the dog doesn't run across the road, doesn't run into the road, boom, truck. That's logic. Instead, I, I could have done what um, I've been told to do for years, and it's just to say, well, it's okay, it wasn't really you. It had no effect that you did the wrong thing, you're a great kid, everything's great, not listening is great, there's no consequences, nothing bad happens. Now graduate from college and everything changes. Now graduate into life and it goes boom, everything has consequences now. Get out of the protection of the family and all of a sudden, everything has consequences. Because we have mixed lying with love and the truth with hate. I mean, you only have to watch the news to figure that out. Everything is hate speech now. Everything. Phrases I just think are cool. Hate speech. Phrases that I've always said, I never thought a thing about the hate speech. If I dislike something, I hate it. I hate yellow cheese. I really thought I just disliked the taste of it. I hate hamburgers. But I hate yellow cheese! Because I, I say I don't want yellow cheese. So therefore, me speaking against something and being honest, I instantly hate. That's a lot of what we're raised to believe. And what we're raised to believe is if we're honest with somebody and we tell them something that's not positive, it's hate. But the truth is, we need to reverse it and put it back where it goes. We need to look at Israel and go, you are the most loving father I can think of. The one who sits me down and says, you know what? You're a little too violent. Yeah, figure that out. You know what? You probably shouldn't hit people. Okay, that's good. I'm not going to say I was raised by hippies, but I was raised by hippies. And they had, they had this concept, you know, be gentle and everything's gentle and it's all alright and everything's lost over. I got in a fight at school. My mom buys me ice cream. I don't know why she did that. And instead of sitting me down and going, you shouldn't be fighting, she bought me ice cream. It seemed logical. This 
morning I had a batch of phones, and I should have, I realized y'all love your phones. They work, though. They really do if you need to tell somebody something. And, and sometimes that may be where you are, but then you may need to pick up your phone and be like, honestly, I want to be honest with you. I'm worried about your soul. I'm, and it may be a friend, it may be a family member, it may be whatever, but it's going to take you being like Israel and removing the cheat he had in his deathbed. Removing that and saying, you know what, you don't have that cheat, but you do have the power of God. And you don't have the promise of tomorrow. So you have today where you can sit there and finally confront those who you are waiting to confront and say, in a loving spirit, there's something wrong. There's something in you that needs to be fixed. I love you. I don't hate you. Because as for Proverbs, friends and enemies, the friend can wound. And we can be friends and we can be family to people. And that's going to require wounds. It used to say that, the, the, you know, your friend, you know, tries to get you out of stuff, your best friend is sitting next to you. But the truth is, if your best friend is sitting next to you, maybe they shouldn't have been listening. Maybe you should have been a better friend. So, so tonight's lesson is, it doesn't fit with a normal invitation because it's not about anybody in this room. It may be about someone in this room. It is possible. My son is in here. He needs a beating tonight. Just for his existence. But I want you to consider those in your life right now that you, you know that if you have this deathbed opportunity, if you were sitting there and you were leaning on this and you knew the words of God and you knew what God had said to you and the message he preached when those who came to him broke him. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized. And there was at that day 3,000 souls. But we must consider what we would do. What would you do if you knew that, like Israel, you were sitting on your deathbed and you know these are the words from God? And you know that these words are what they will face in eternity. And you have a choice to really love people and pretend like you don't have tomorrow because you don't. You only have today. Tomorrow you only have today. <coughs> Next day you only have today. And your challenge is this, is to consider what you would say. Consider that person in your life that you're needing to say the right things to. That you're needing to confront. That's the challenge part of this lesson. With, with all the lessons, we offer an invitation that if that's you, you know, you need to respond to this. You know that you need to be repentant and confessing Christ. You need to be baptized into Christ. And you need to be walking with Christ. Or if you need prayers, or you wish to submit to the eldership here, we ask you to come now as we stand, as we sit.